Yeah, and if y'all have questions for each other, we could also do that. But I think I'm going to start with this question. Both of you are like at a very prolific point of your careers. Like Ken, you said you had something like six books coming out this year. Rob, I know you have like project after project coming out. It seems pretty steady for the last couple of years. So I guess um, every writer kind of has their method of like keeping up on their work if, when they're prolific. And I'm just curious like um, what your process has been, how you've maintained kind of that energy and that grit. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Well, I'm going to let Ken start because uh, anybody who can get seven books of poems uh, numbering over 400 sonnets done in about a minute, that, that question goes to you first. <laughs> <laughs> well, part of it is I've been doing this for a while. Uh, and just as an aside, I, I, I did go through an MFA program. This was in the 80s, the mid 80s, late 80s in Fairbanks, Alaska as a fiction writer. I wrote, I wrote stories and I started writing poems there. And one of the things I liked about poems was you could finish them quick. And I, have a, and I had a knack for that. I mean, not, not to downplay, but you can, you can, they're shorter. And so the books that came out, the sports book, I mean, I, those poems, a lot of them had been written years ago and then added a few more once the book was accepted for a certain length that, that she wanted. Uh, the, book, the, 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 the book with the writing party, that also was written years ago. Uh, and I have some that are still like, you know, in waiting as we do as writers. But the Trump stuff, uh, that I feel as if I was chosen. I mean, I, I have a knack for, for form and, and the sonnets, 14 lines. It's a few sentences and I can do it. And the first one, it was the day after the election in 2016. I was starting a residency. I go around as an artist. I was going to be working in schools in Bowling Green, Kentucky. And I was sitting in my car, listening to the news. And I just remember I wrote a line. I said, this guy is going to make George W. look like a statesman. That was the line. And then I turned that into a sonnet a few days later, wrote another. And then because I had a circumstance in early December 2016, I was visiting a friend in a foreign country who didn't have internet, who slept late, and I had time and I started writing three, four a day. And I had the, that first book by the inauguration. I, my, my publisher, somebody I knew who liked the poems, we got it out quickly. And that volume one was a joke. But then mm. I started writing uh, more because I have, I'm following the story. I can write it. I, I'm not faculty somewhere where, you know, there's, this guy is taboo. There's all sorts of things about this that are really strange in, in our history right now. And I'm, what, you know, you write your obsessions, you know, I'm obsessed with this, so I'm able to write it. And I have stuff I think to say, and I do a lot of stuff in voices. So it's not, it's very few of them are, are me, but they're coming from a different uh, when I, I was going to read one of the poems from this, uh, when I was in two years ago, I just said, name a country. And I, and if you name a country, uh, there's, there's probably a sonnet from that country. I had 72 different countries. So, uh, and you just come up with voices. It's not like writing a novel. It's, it's, it's a voice. It's, it's 14 lines and then you're on to the next one. And I'm able to to right now, the volume, I finished volume seven, five, six, and seven are all in Trump's voice. Uh, eight, I'm starting, and I'm just, I've, I've come up with like about a hundred occupations, and I'm just gonna say like, you know, steel worker, Peoria, or whatever, and just have a uh, hundred voices, and I'll probably go 70, 30, you know, like, you know, there are people who love him, but you know, I'm gonna write seven, I think I'm gonna write another hundred, and try to make that volume eight. And then I got, there's gonna be at some point the fall of the house of Trump. I mean, I got more to do, it's, it's not over. And it's, I feel like it's, I was chosen to do this. Mm. With, uh, let's see, with me, I think it's more of an illusion, Willie. Uh, <laughs> it's not that I've been, uh, suddenly I've been writing uh, a zillion things as much as, um, I had been writing and writing and writing and writing and writing and writing over a long time and in the present. And then all of the books sort of got accepted or the publication schedule 
kind of makes it look as if, oh yeah, this guy just wrote three books in nine months. Um, and, and, you know, that's not quite how the timing worked out that way, but that isn't really, I wrote them over a longer period of time. Mm. Yeah. Sometimes it just, uh, you can go, well, I don't know, several years before you have a, a publisher say yes. Mm-hmm. Um, it's nice when they say yes. It would be ideal if it were something you could count on, you know, <laughs> but you can't. And so you just take it in a flurry if it comes in a flurry. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yes, my mic's on. Um, one question I had for Ken, um, you have talked about this a little bit, but the sonnet, why have you kind of chosen that form? Is there any other contemporary people you see yourself in com- conversation with? Um, a lot of talk uh, around like the literary circles I hang out with at least is that like the sonnet is kind of in this huge resurgence. There's a lot of poets kind of returning to it and being drawn to it. And I was just wondering like um, how you fit yourself in that conversation. Um, yeah, why, why the choice of the sonnet um, as opposed to other shorter forms? I write sonnets quite a bit too. Um, the reason that I write sonnets uh, is because I, I, I well, I like how much they're pressurized, all right? Mm -hmm. But what I really like about sonnets is that at some point they have to turn, right? You cannot simply proceed lockstep 14 and stop lines in a row and be done. You have to turn at some point. And that's where the energy is, that you establish something and then you contrast that and then you look for a synthesis at the end. That's a pattern and shape we all have to do as writers of essays anyway thesis, antithesis, synthesis, a sonnet just lets you do it faster. And because they could be mnemonic, I mean, they should be, they're metered, they're rhymed. Even if there's enjambment, there's probably still, you know, a sense of that. Uh, They're memorable. You can't remember, say, a five paragraph or a 10 paragraph essay and Mm -hmm. deliver it, but a sonnet, you absolutely can. It's nice because I want to try and carry everything around in my memory, right? So that if somebody ever says, well, let me hear a poem, I don't have to say, sure, let's get in my car, drive to my house, and I'll get it off to the, the you know, the, the floor where I left it this morning. I could just let her rip. So a sonnet is good because it's memorable. A sonnet is good because of the structure. A sonnet is especially good because there's already a dramatic moment in the form itself, because you have to turn. And then you have to resolve. So it's like act one, act two, act three, which we're used to in film, by way of theater. Shoot, even sitcoms have have that structure, act one, act two, act three, with commercial breaks as the curtain of intermission. So um, that's why I like them. Uh, Ken sounds like he likes them because uh, he's adept. But uh, I can't tell if he's there yet. Yeah, I can't tell Something if he's got, there. His screen. Uh, Wait, are you there? Something. Yeah, I'm here. Something went buzzy, so I took off the headphones, and uh, so I missed the question. I heard a little bit about Rob's answer, or something about is it form or sonnets? I didn't. Yeah. Uh, yes. So my question was essentially um, why you're drawn to the sonnet. The sonnet's kind of having a resurgence in a lot of contemporary literature, at least with a lot of the circles I hang around. So I was wondering how you fit yourself into uh, the conversation of the contemporary sonnet and yes, why you're drawn to it. Uh, It's, I don't know if I have an an easy answer. I started writing sonnets. I have a clue, I find it, I don't know if I'm gonna find it easily here, but I have this thing called Conditions and Cures. And way back in, this would have been in the early, mid-90s, I had an illness time, and I took a leave. I was a tenure-track professor in Nome, Alaska, and I was just starting to write poems. I was just getting a few. I had an illness time. I took a leave of absence, had to resign my job. I was really sick. And on the other side of it, uh, it took a while to even start writing again. And when I did, one of the things I, I wrote about disease and disability, my own issues I was having at the time, and I came across a book by uh, Norman Cousins, I think, Anatomy of an Illness. And there was uh, the idea of laughter is healing. And I saw a lot of 
old movies in that time. I thought, well, I'm a writer. Instead of just a Marx Brothers movie or Buster Keaton or a Woody Allen or a Charlie Chaplin, I'll watch it and then write. And I started writing sonnets then and I, something clicked and I wrote, it's, it's in one of the collections and I, some of the, there's a section of sports sonnets, a section of writer sonnets. And then uh, before the Trump stuff, I started writing George W. Bush poems, one book of that, all sonnets. And so it's just something that, once again, there are 14 lines. I have a knack for it. As Rob said, I think I adept and uh, God, you know, it's just something that I, I, I find I can get in and get out and, and, and make it work. I mean, it's, to me, it's an accident, but it's, it's a happy accident. Whenever you write something that's pretty good, it's a happy accident. This question is going to be for Rob, but um, I think it'll apply to Ken too. Um, I'm just curious about like, like, so you're drawing from like a dude named Christopher Smart, who's like this lunatic poet. Um, I, I, my question, I guess, is like, how, how did you find that? And like, um, like, where do your reading tactics take you? And I feel like the, the broader question that I'm reaching for, for both Ken and you, is like, what contemporary poets are you reading? Or do you feel yourself more drawn to like, um, you know, older people who are already dead? Uh, I can't remember the exact first time I ran into Christopher Smart, but it was the excerpt first. Uh, and then I wanted that, and of course you can get anything you want on the internet, but I thought, no, I want it in book form. And so I had to, I had to learn, right? I had to learn, oh, that's uh, lifted out for anthologies. That, that ode for, to Jeffrey is, is a lift out from the, the long religious tract, uh, Jubilate Agno. So I bought that. And the whole book is very, very interesting because he's so full of energy, right? Um, uh, his phrases are so whack, they almost feel new uh, in the same way that Anne Sexton can seem new. I mean, Anne Sexton in, in one of her long poems called Hurry Up, Please, It's Time, has a little riff in the voice of her or celebrating her alter ego, a character that she calls Ms. Dog. Uh, Ms. Dog likes to, sun uh, likes to sunbathe nude, la-di-da. Right. And uh, at one point she talks to the sun. Oh, sun, you hammer of yellow. Uh, you, you, you hat on fire. You honeysuckle mama. Pour your blonde on me. You know, uh, and she talks about being, you know, th that kind of celebration in her voice is not really all that different than the celebration that uh, uh, Christopher uh, Smart was up to, you know, in the 1700s, I think I'm just kind of drawn to that voice. I love Walt Whitman too. Um, contemporary poets that I like, you know, uh, always friends, sure. I like Scott Poole, I like Jesse Randall, but it's not always Americans that I, that I read. There are some Eastern European poets in translation that I like a bunch. A uh, Polish poet named uh, Zbigniew Herbert, uh, a Czech poet named Vasco Popa, and a Slovenian named Tomasz Solomon. And Solomon is one of those ones, high energy and weird also. Um, you know, um, think about an Eastern European surrealist version of Frank O'Hara's lunch poems. That's <laughs> Tomasz Solomon. Um, so I think that's what I'm drawn to um, more than, oh, I don't know, sonorousness. Or, or a lot of frowns, because I really like Richard Garcia too. And that mm. guy is also really, really good. And, you know, sometimes sad, but also just exuberant and smart and inventive. So those kinds of things I think are what captivate me. 